thousands of years before the invention of modern microscopes, a unique breed of philosophers would work out the basic principles of matter in a way that is nearly impossible for us to believe. They were the atomists, a name taken from their groundbreaking theory that saw all of material existence as composed of small indivisible units, the atoms, or no cut in Greek. One of the earliest champions of this theory was a man called Democritus, but most of what he wrote is now lost. Among the few who accepted his teachings, however, was Epicurus, a name that still conjures up luxurious feasts and all the pleasures of the flesh imaginable, but who in reality was responsible for perfecting and passing on the teachings of his master, stretching them to the point of imagining that we live in a matrix-like universe where reality itself is pixelated. Many of his teachings would also be lost, but some, would make it across the dark centuries of the Middle Ages, rediscovered during the Renaissance and into the Enlightenment, where they helped to establish modern science, through which they reached us. Lacking technology, the atomists arrived at their remarkable conclusion through logic and by way of a thought experiment. Let's suppose, they said, that you take a piece of matter, anything from a piece of wood to a drop of water, and divide it in half. Then, taking one of these two halves, you divide it again, so that you end up with a quarter. Now, take the quarter and divide it in half once more, repeating the process again and again, dividing the smallest piece in half, cutting and cutting into infinity until... until what? There is evidence that the Greeks never really believed in infinity as an actual reality, but used it as a figure of speech to mean a very big number. And so, for them, this process of infinite division would have to come to an end at some point. And when it does, after millions upon millions of divisions, we should be left with the smallest piece of matter imaginable. So small, in fact, that we almost have to ask what would happen if we tried to perform one final cut. And it was precisely at this point that the atomists made their most daring claim. They said that only one of two things could happen. If the piece that is left could actually be divided, being the closest anything can get to zero, it would actually disappear, as the two halves would round down to nothingness. This, however, would mean that reality is also made up of nothingness, being reducible to nothingness by breaking it apart. That would be like adding a bunch of zeros and eventually getting a one. Impossible which means that such a final cut was also impossible, and that by cutting in half for a near infinity, you will eventually reach a basic, indivisible element. And so, these renegade thinkers proposed an idea that in recent centuries would become a scientific fact, that all reality, and as diverse as it appears at first, is actually made up of small, indivisible units. They called these units non-sectionable, or atomo in Greek, from where our word for atoms comes from. Ancient sources claim that the first to ever propose such a theory was a man called Lefkipus, who lived around the time of Socrates, while his most celebrated student was Democritus. But both of their writings are now lost. This might not be due to negligence, however, as their theories about the material nature of everything were not popular among the Greeks of their times, and even Plato was reputed to have said that all of Democritus' writings should be gathered in one place and burned. But atomic theory survived, until about a century later it was passed to Epicurus, from whose letters most of what we know about this early science derives. 
It's through Epicurus that we learn how the atomists followed their theory to its logical conclusion, that reality is uniform, as it's essentially made up of the same basic stuff, the same atoms, but of different shapes and sizes. These differences in shape and size alone is what accounts for water, iron and air appearing so different to our senses. From their new and powerful point of view, the qualities that we perceive, such as weight and color, do not exist independently, but are the byproduct of the ways in which atoms interact with our bodies by the way they hit our sense organs. The atoms themselves do not need any of the qualities they produce in order to produce them. They can lack color, for example, but give rise to the sensation of color simply by the way they enter our eyes. This was actually spot on in describing the, our sense of smell, which is actually caused by particles that escape our dinner plate through heat. But even vision, and with a small nip and tuck, can also be explained through atoms and the photons that hit the retina of our eyes, even though they originally came from the sun rather than the objects themselves. But beyond these observations, the reason that Epicurus theories are surprisingly modern is that he understood how a limited number of elements can give rise to the entire physical universe. In contrast to his powerful insights, modern chemistry had to evolve little by little for almost 2,000 years before it reached the same conclusions by building the periodic table. But when it finally did, Every high school student learned that Epicurus was right and that water is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen, the famous H2O. Notice how both hydrogen and oxygen are gases, while the result of their union is a liquid. Epicurus had understood that atoms do not need to share the properties of the materials they compose prior to composing them, but generate different materials just by coming together in different ways. But Epicurus would surpass even the atomists in his capacity of reimagining the nature of reality by theorizing that apart from matter, space itself had a minimum quantity, a reality that is somehow pixelated where objects move like sprites on a computer screen and for at least one pixel at a time, as if we live in a giant simulation. And as crazy as it sounds, celebrated physicist Werner Heisenberg, made popular by the TV series Breaking Bad, actually thought that Epicurus was right and he proposed that no object could move for a distance smaller than the length of a Planck's constant. Epicurus never expressed his ideas as clearly as we have done here, of course, but the principles are there in his writings, many of which have the militant style of modern defenders of science, like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins. Because if you thought that all this early reductionism would eventually lead Epicurus to reject religion, you would be right as this philosopher inaugurated an early form of a scientific atheism that is quickly gaining ground, although his version resonated with a poetic quality that is often missing today. In a letter to one of his students, for example, and while explaining how in certain cases religious beliefs might, by accident, prove to be correct, Epicurus says that it is better to be rationally unfortunate than irrationally fortunate, and that it's better for a beautiful theory to have the wrong results than for an ugly one to have the right results only by chance. But despite their originality, the atomists never had a great impact on the culture of ancient Greece, with Aristotle, arguably the best mind of his time and beyond, mocking many of their conclusions. And the real reasons behind this rejection might prove to be even more interesting than the theories themselves. 
a rabbit hole that we promise to follow in our next episodes, running deep in the roots of modern science, the science that eventually accepted Epicurus, showing, however, that the reasons might not be as noble as we once thought.